You know, I, I, you, somebody giggled. Ooh, somebody, oh, that's so much better. Thank you. I, I couldn't see. Could you? I couldn't see. I was like, anyway. Um, I'm thinking, how am I going to preach? But no, we didn't twin on purpose. Like I showed up and I'm like, get out. We just laughed at each other. When I saw her, I'm like, this is hilarious. But anyway, um, we might need to go to Ross again. <laughs> Try on some boots. Anyway, no boots, no boots. So um, y'all kind of giggled when I said, you know, God is, he's the husband, but that's something that he spoke to me early on in my 20s when I, I felt like the Lord I, let me know that I was not going to marry. And at least until this point, it's been a prophetic thing that's come to pass. Um, there have been opportunities, but I knew what the Lord had called me to. And yeah, and so I said, Lord, I'm good with that, but I need you to be my husband because I can't do this by myself. And, you know, sometimes as you get older, it gets a little bit harder, but God's grace gets more sufficient. And he always provides, always. And there have been times, Lola, Lola, right, where I literally took my bills and I laid them on the couch. And I said, okay, Lord, here's the thing. The Bible says the Lord God, your maker, he shall be your husband. I said, so here it is. These are the bills I need you to pay. <laughs> it's like this is what we have, do, we have due. <laughs> and I need your provision for that. I can't carry this. And do you know, there's not one time when the Lord has ever failed me. Not, not one time, not one time. He's always been faithful. And I, I see that in all of the days of your life and your son's life. God will provide. He will provide. And I just, I just pray for a more than enough blessing over you, Lola, and your son. I pray healing over your son. Just total healing. Come on, let's pray that. Lord, thank you. We pray for her son, Lord, uh, for, for the ADHD, for the things, Lord, that are driving his unsettledness and behavior. Lord, uh, even science doesn't understand all of it. That's okay. You're the creator. You know the most minute wiring and detail of his little chemistry in his mind and his body. And so, God, I pray that you would minister to him right now. And we speak, Lord, healing over him. Brain disorders can come back to order again. And so we pray order over his little body and his mind and his emotions, Lord, in his chemicals in his body. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, you know, I still have my books back there. Um, so if you haven't gotten one, go ahead and uh, just encourage you to pick one up. So is anyone, does anyone not have the book yet? <laughs> Y'all are like, we, should we raise our hands? Should we not raise our hands? Right. I saw your hand first right here. So can I give this to you tonight? Yeah. There you go. You're welcome. Um, tonight I, I want to, I, you know, this is why I love being here is because I know that Pastor Ed and Pastor Connie will just let me flow, and I can even interrupt myself when I feel the Holy Spirit moving. <laughs> it's, it's a gift when you can interrupt yourself, right? I just sense the Holy Spirit right now. Um, kind of won't, I just feel like I can't jump into the message yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's just wait on the Lord for a moment. Holy Spirit, whatever you want. Friends, I, again, and I, I hope uh, Pastor Connie can correct me, um, I'm, I would receive it, but um, I keep seeing that picture in my head of offerings being brought to the front, and I was thinking, even as Lola was talking, that, you know, in the New Testament, everyone brought together what they had so that the people that had needs their needs could be met. And I don't know. I don't know what that means. Um, except that I think there's some pressing needs maybe here tonight where there are some people who just need kind of that 
that just day-to-day -day survival miracle financially and for the basics. So, so yeah, if you, can I do it this way? If you would feel like the Lord's impressing you to give toward the church, being able to help some of these people that they're familiar with, they know the situation. Is, am I good? Would you just bring your offering at any time um, to the front or you can hand it to Pastor Connie tonight? I just really sense that in my heart. And um, man, I remember times where I, one time when I had been hurt um, and my dad, you know, Pastor Connie asked me to share my testimony. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to do that. I hadn't planned on doing that tonight. But um, my dad was in ministry, but he was, he, the dad that was in the pulpit, I always wanted him to come home with us and be our dad at home. And we suffered a lot of violence and cruelty at his hands. Um, in my book, I, I give a couple of examples. In the beginning, I was scared one time. We were going over the Royal Gorge Can Canyon uh, Bridge. It's a suspension bridge, so it kind of sways a little bit. It's in Colorado. We lived just a, a short distance from there. And, and I was very afraid. I was probably four, and I just held on to the bridge. I leaned down. It's kind of a linked, link kind of walkway. And I grabbed it, and my dad saw what was happening. He came over to me. He said, are you afraid? And I said, yes. You know, I'm afraid of falling. I mean, it, it's, if you've been to the Royal Gorge, you know how high that canyon is and that bridge is. And he came over, and he picked me up. And, man, I just, like, I had a death grip on his neck, right? And he walked over to the edge, and he pulled my arms off of him, and he turned me face outward, and he put me out over the open air and was laughing and he, he had done that repeatedly. And so, and then you go home and, you know, it can be a few days later and he would put my brothers and I on the roof of the house and make us jump to him. And I'm like, I, I can't trust. Do I trust? I have to. I'm obligated to trust someone that I don't trust. And there were physical things that happened, um, obviously, um, and my mom was... Uh, had a lot of that, but my brothers and I suffered a lot of physical uh, harm from him as well. And so I remember one time trying to be a part after, after college, um, trying to be a part of where he was at in ministry. And let me just say this. I believe my dad has had a real call on his life, but there are places he hasn't allowed like some of, like all of us at one point or another, God to invade all of us, all of us. It needs to, he needs to be like oil, where you can't keep oil out of the cracks and crevices. He has to, he has to invade the whole person, right? And transformation comes like that. And uh, I remember trying to be a part, like leading youth at his church, and I was hurt by something. Um, that happened, he confronted me, I was probably 21, and, or I was 21 or 22, and he slapped me across the face in front of the youth group, he forgot where he was, really, just slapped me, and I remember being so angry, and I remember thinking, I don't want anything to do with ministry, I'm never coming back here again, you know, just out of hurt, because I was trying so hard, and I wanted his approval, you know, and, and I felt called to ministry, you know, I was doing my best, and he misunderstood something and took it out on me, and and um, and I was humiliated and et cetera. And so I just I left there. I tore out of that parking lot, buddy, and I drove back to where I was living at the time. And and I remember that affecting me so deeply that I eventually, shortly thereafter, stopped going to church. I just stopped going, and I'm like. No, it's okay. I'm good. Which I wasn't. I knew I wasn't. But I couldn't find a place. I just was like, there's something broken, not just in our family, but in me. And none of this is working. But I believe in God and I love God, but I haven't found my tribe yet, you know. Like, and I remember just really it was an excuse to, to not go because I was angry and hurt. And as I stopped doing that, then I stopped tithing. 
in giving because I wasn't going to church. And I was literally, the Lord allowed me to just go down that path. And I remember thinking, I have no money for groceries this week. I have no money for gas. I've got, I don't know how I'm going to get to work. If I can't get to work, I don't make a paycheck. And if I don't make a paycheck, then I can't get gas and I can't get groceries. And I mean, I remember thinking to myself, well, it's, it's Sunday. And that was back in the day when they did have Sunday night services still. And I remember the Lord just allowed me to be broken right then. And I, I cried out to the Lord. I said, God, this is not right. Like, I'm hungry for you. <laughs> That's what's wrong. That's what's missing. I'm hungry for you. And Lord, if you'll help me, I'll get my life in order before you. I'll align myself again. And I'll start walking in obedience again. So God, I'm, and that was back in the day, you still wore a skirt, you know, to church. So I had a skirt on and everything. And I had cute shoes on. And then, but I put my tennis shoes in my car. I was driving on E which I never did, but I had to because I didn't have any money. And so I put my tennis shoes in my car and I told the Lord, I made up my mind, I'm going to church. I put my tennis shoes in my car because I told the Lord, if it runs out of gas, I'll walk, but I'm going to church. I don't care how long it takes me to get there. They might be shutting the door when I arrive. That's okay. I want you to see I'm going, I'm going to your house. And I'm going to serve you, whether my dad slaps me, beats me, or loves me and accepts me. And he's healed, I'm healed, whatever. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to serve you, Lord. And I want your blessing on my life. And I remember I started going. I'm, I mean, I'm praying that old Cutlass Supreme, you know. <laughs> I'm praying that thing into the church parking lot. And I pull into that church parking lot, and I started crying. And I said, Lord... It was a church, not my dad's church. It was another church. And um, I, had, I, was, I had dated a guy from that church, so that's how I knew the church, right? And so I pulled in the parking lot, and I said, Lord, if I could have, I think I said, if I could have $10, I could make it till payday next weekend on Friday. I could use five for, you ready for it? Bologna sandwiches, <laughs> right? Yeah. You can fry that bologna, too, and pretend like it's, you know, sausage in the morning or whatever. And I was like, I can have bread and bologna. I can have toast. I can make sandwiches for lunch, and I can have $5 to put in my tank. And, Lord, I'm just asking you, would you do that? And if you will, God, I'll tithe on that $10. <laughs> I'll give the dollar, you know. But, Lord, please help me, and I'll, and I'll make things right. I go into the service, and the preacher's preaching, and, he calls people up, you know, that have needs, and it was a big church, and so I was like, I can be anonymous, you know, so I came over here on this side, and I was knelt down, and an elderly man came up to me, and he put his, he patted me on my shoulders, and he said, darling, don't you love Texas? He's like, darling, you asked the Lord for something tonight before you came in. And he told me to tell you, he's going to give that to you. And I said, oh, wow. And I just started crying. And I was like, okay. Well, then church ended. And I'm like, I don't have $10 yet, you know. <laughs> and so here comes this guy. <laughs> this guy, you know what I'm saying? No. This guy came over to me and he's like, hey, there's this, we're having a spaghetti dinner. Um tonight and I want to buy you your your dinner like and I was like hey you know <laughs> on two levels no I'm just kidding so I was like oh my gosh thank you you know and so we went up to have you know our spaghetti dinner that was raising funds for missions or whatever and somehow by the end I was kind of just sitting there I think he had gone off and the other people at our table went off to talk to someone and this girl that I had met um I only met her like once, and she worked at a bank, you know, and she just had it all together, it seemed like to me, and she came over, and she sat down, and she goes, how are you doing? I'm doing, you know, good. How are you? You know, good, and, and she chit-chatted, and then she goes, I can't just chit-chat with you. I was like, what do you mean? And she, she started crying. She said, I hope I don't offend you, 
but there's something the Lord told me to give you, and I, I have to give it to you. And I don't understand. Maybe this is funny, but here, and she handed me a $20 bill. Wow. And so I'm like, I just started weeping. I just started weeping. Friend, God knows your need. Like Pastor Connie was talking about, it's those moments. You know, it's those moments that God delights in showing up and meeting your needs that nobody else knows about. That's a secret prayer with your tennis shoes in the back seat of your car. And you're saying, God, give me 10. He says, here's 20. You know, now get real breakfast food and bologna sandwiches. You know, like, do it right. Do it right. And so I just want to, I don't know. I'm just feeling like the Lord wants to meet your need. And, um, and, it, and it's, a, it's kind of this just daily life need that you've been you know grinding it out you're just you know hand to mouth and and I believe that if you will honor the Lord and let the oil of his presence and his word get in every crack and crevice of your life and allow him access to places where he hasn't had access where you've literally I'm just feeling this from the Holy Spirit where you literally have said that doesn't matter that's not working against me with my relationship with God. That's so old. That's like history. I don't even need to think about that. If you'll allow the Holy Spirit into those areas and you'll honor the Lord with your finances, you'll see a turnaround financially. And I'm, again, I'm not a prosperity teacher because I believe that what I preach here I, in, in America, if it's the real gospel, I can preach it in the jungle in Africa and it apply to their situation and that's the way it is and their tithe sometimes is a chicken or it's fruit or it's something like that you know my offerings many times even in Thailand have been a basket of fruit right which I'm like I love it Thailand's known as the uh, fruit lovers heaven so I've been in heaven so I probably just wasted um, maybe not wasted but probably took up quite a bit of time there I want to speak to you tonight, ultimately, <laughs> my sermon is called Divine Seasons. Divine Seasons. Have I preached that here? I'm looking at Pastor Gandhi because she's looking at me like, because uh, we talked about this, like when you travel and preach different places. This message has impacted my life, and I would say this is a message out of the journey of my life, right? This Faith walk with the Lord. So I want to talk to you about divine seasons. And I want you to open up to 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 5 through 9. If you're still with me, will you just say amen? amen. Thank you. Reassure me here. 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 5 through 9. And to, uh, wow, okay, that cracks me up. I didn't even know that. I just opened it, and the title of that chapter, at least in my Bible, is Collection for the Saints. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read that. I'm going to read the first four. This basically is Paul talking to the Corinthians and these are people that he is heavily invested in spiritually. And he is writing to them to give them spiritual instructions as a spiritual father. And he's kind of giving them uh, all of these things, laying out doctrine again, reinforcing what he's all already preached, talking about, you know, how to handle certain things in the church and et cetera. And then he's, he goes into, after the first four verses, he goes into this thing that I'm about to read about saying, I really want to see you again. I really want to say that. I feel that way. I felt that way about Fiji. Ten years. I'm like, Lord, if you would let me go there. I just, I have to go back. I feel like you want to do something. And I can imagine that was Paul's longing. And he had invested much more than I had invested, right? So in verse 1, we're going to start and it says, Now concerning, he's talking to them. Now concerning the collection or the offering for the saints, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, I want you to do the same thing. On the first day of the week, let each of you, each one of you, lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, 
that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So he's saying, instead of me coming and showing up and you bring an offering on that day, I want you to start planning financially for what the Lord wants to do. Right? So he's saying, instead of saying like, well, that's offering day, I'm going to do it. No, he said, the first day every, every week, I want you to start laying something aside. And he's like, so that you may prosper. And I don't think he's just talking financially. I think he's saying, like, so that your soul may prosper, so that God's blessing would be on you. And you're giving to other places where you may never go, but your gift is a spiritual seed that allows the gospel to go to places like the South Pacific, islands that we've never even heard their name, right? And so this is what Paul is saying. And then he says this. He gets personal. And he starts talking about his personal plans. And he says, now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia. And it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. And he goes, just this whole thing right here just got me when I read that. Because it doesn't sound normal. (laughs) Normal people, and I say that in the flesh, not walking in the spirit. when When there are many adversaries, you leave. (laughs) Like... You run, right? I mean, the American church, we've trained ourselves that if persecution comes, we rebuke it. It's not God's will. It shouldn't happen to us. He wants us to be rich. Everybody have a new car. Everybody have a new house. Everybody's good, right? But that's not, that is not a spiritual principle. That is the opposite of what God says in his word. He says, there are going to be times where you suffer with me. And if you'll drink the cup of my sufferings, if you'll be associated with me, a man who is despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and grief, a man who wasn't popular, who wasn't famous of of a good fame, but infamous as a despised person. Right? He says, if you'll associate with me, and be willing to be hidden in me. <laughs> then, then, there'll be a blessing on your life. Then I'll cause your soul to prosper. You'll see the mysteries of the gospel. You'll see the mysteries of the kingdom. You'll see the depths of God that, that are hidden in the broken places. Anybody in the house? And so it's very interesting because he's talking about this and he says, listen, I want to, I long to see you, but I don't want to see you in passing when I just pass through. So I'm going to wait until I can come maybe in the winter because I want to spend a good amount of time with you. And he said, besides that, um, I have chosen, I've determined I will stay at Ephesus until Pentecost and, it, and then he says, he says the thing, for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. So I want to jump into what was going on in Ephesus. If you read Acts chapter 19 and 20, you can see the adversaries that Paul was facing, the majority of which were not pagan people, but people who were uh, the Jewish people. <laughs> Judaism. The priests at the temple, they, the holy men, the clergy, the religious, the Pharisees, all of these people coming against Paul. They were stirring up trouble against him because he was preaching something that didn't fit their religious order. He was breaking the mold. He was presenting fulfilled prophecy when he talked about Jesus. Listen, you're talking about a Messiah to come. He's come and he died and he rose again. And there are witnesses to all of these things. And he was persecuted for that, right? 
So all of these things, he was chased, he was persecuted, he was talked about. And, you know, when I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, wow, what a commitment level to say, I can see the opportunity more than I see the adversaries. I see, Lord, what you're wanting to do in the spirit more than what I'm suffering in my flesh. And because of that reason, I know this is there, and I know why it's there. It's there because of this. <laughs> but because of this, I'll stay my course. I could, tell, I could keep you here all night, which I won't do, telling you stories of the greatest warfare that I ever experienced. And you can read about a lot of that in my book, my latest book. It's my only book, but it sounds more fancy if I say it's my latest. <clears throat> You can read about that, where I literally, when we would put a date on the calendar, my team and I in Argentina, we did conferences all over the world and all over Argentina. The Argentine government ended up funding. The last one we did, the Senate allocated 20, 25,000 U.S. dollars to fund this Pentecostal spirit-filled event where people, even from the convention center, were getting saved and delivered and baptized in the Holy Spirit in one whack. It was phenomenal, phenomenal, but it came with a price. See, that's why some of you here today, I believe that during this fast, God was speaking things to you. Be, be prepared that as you go to deeper levels, you'll discover a devil coming after you at greater levels as well. He increases warfare so that he can create distractions and get you to want to run away from the fight. But you got to stay the course. Why? Because this is sacred and that's a distraction. Yeah. This is eternal and that is temporary. Hello? Yeah. What happens in your family? Listen, listen to me. I, I, I don't mean that condescending, but listen. What is happening, what the Lord is challenging you to fast and pray and fight for in your families is eternal. What it has to do with is breaking generational cycles and strongholds and introducing a new direction in your families. That's where the book is named from, 180 Degrees to Freedom. It's like, God, help me to navigate a turnaround in the momentum of our lineage. My dad was violent. I was violent. I had to confront Having violent tendencies. That's how I learned how to cope with things. I saw it modeled for me. And I remember waking up one day and looking in the mirror and going, I'm just like my dad. Angry, mad, raging all the time, violent tendencies, bowing up on people. I know you can't picture that with my little curly hair right now. <laughs> my fake curly hair. No, I mean... I know you can't picture that, but it was so, it was so ingrained in me. But, you, you know, here's the thing. Like, I didn't have a choice in that uh, intrusion in my life. But I want to tell you one thing. I had a choice in if I allowed it to stay or not. Hello? If I allowed that to continue and I repeat that same sin, or I can stand against it, and see freedom in my own life, and then call it out in the lives of others so that they can have freedom. Because what you confront and you overcome, God gives you an authority to speak to that. I don't know who I'm talking to here, to here tonight, but to somebody. So I want to I want to kind of do a little side path here, but it's it's kind of like your your roads out front, which I haven't seen those roads before, where you kind of go like this and you go on the side, and like Siri says. Turn slightly right. And I'm like, here? Right now? Here? Like, you know, turn right and then come here. Yeah, turn left. I'm like, like, left, left? No, just a little left. I don't know if yours talks back to you, but no, mine doesn't either. So it's a little left. No, veer right, veer right. You know, it's like those little off things. That's what I'm doing in my sermon right now. I want to talk to you about consecration because this is critical to everything that I want to talk to you tonight and the things that I, the insights and the word that I, I, Pray the Holy Spirit helps me give. To consecrate something means to make or declare something or someone sacred. To dedicate someone or something formally to a divine purpose. So to be consecrated means to be set apart by God. Right? 
And in the Bible, we see that persons, people were often described or declared holy by God, like the priests, the tribe of Aaron, the Levites, all of this. They were set aside for certain purposes, right, by God. But it's interesting that sometimes we overlook that times were also declared as consecrated, holy, or set aside by God. So my question tonight for you, and I, I love that the Lord like laid this message on my heart because you're coming out of this 21-day fast, some of you more, for the whole month, right? And it's interesting because this is where your hearing will be more keen than any other time in your life. Your hearing, like when you've been fasting, it, it fine-tunes your ear to hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit about things that you're asking the Lord for, Right? So, what season are you in? What season are you in right now? So, the Bible talks about the Sabbath being holy unto the Lord. The feast in Leviticus 23, you can read about that. The feasts were set aside and consecrated holy times and season, seasons unto the Lord. The year of Jubilee was a thing set up by God, and it was a specific time. It was a specific season. All of those things were set aside and set apart as holy. And the functions of the priests was to distinguish and let the people know and announce those feasts and announce those holy times so that they would be able to distinguish between the holy and the common, not just another Sunday, not just another day, not just another year. Does that make sense? You tracking? So, so it is with us even today. We think, oh, that's Old Testament. No, it's actually, a, a, the Old Testament was a type and shadow of what we're living out today fulfilled through Jesus, right? So we have to be able to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the natural and spiritual realm, between the kairos and the chronos. We have to be able to discern time and discern seasons. The chronos, chron chronological time, is what we see on the clock uh, you know, the rising of the sun and the setting of it and the coming out of the moon and all of that stuff, that's chronological time. Kairos is God's time. It's God's determinations that don't go by a set pattern that we can grasp with our finite mind. It's a thing of the spirit. You have to be listening to understand when God's bringing you into a divine season. And listen, when you're looking for new levels spiritually, when you're looking for breakthrough or advancement, spiritual growth, freedom, all of those things that are at risk if we're not able to identify when God is bringing us into a divine season. So how do you know when you're entering into a divinely ordained season? Because that's what I want to talk to you about. How can you identify Kairos moments? Paul did that. How could he say, my heart is with you, believers that believe we're on the same team? You know, I'm just realizing it. Earlier today, like before service, like a couple hours, I was like, gosh, I feel, I feel lonely for my team, you know, which is I'm a part of the executive pastoral staff at, um, at Live the Life Church in San Antonio. I base out of there. We do everything in teams. We never do life alone. We don't do ministry alone. And so that's been a new thing for me because for 25, 26 years, I've been all over the world, you know, and, and a lot of, you know, 24-hour flights and travel and by myself. And so I recognize and I'm like, oh, Lord, this is kind of a good alone that I feel. It's because you've set me up with people. We're all moving in the right direction. We share everything. We're in the altar together. It's awesome. And I see you have that here, and I love that. I, that's why I love this church, right? And so I'm thinking about how Paul must have felt like, I want to be with y'all. That's what he's saying. I want to be with you. But here's the way, like, it's almost like, can I just say spiritual brats? Like spiritual brats would be like, I want to be up there, right? And we throw a fit. And we think we're being punished because God keeps us at Ephesus where we're being persecuted or it's simply uncomfortable. 
and we get so caught up in the uncomfortable and comparing and wishing we were, you know, fulano de tal, which that person or this person or whatever, we want to be over there and man, they've got it. They're on easy street. Why can't that be my life? And God says, can you not see that there's a great and effective door that's been opened to you in this place? You're not here because you're being punished. You're not going through the opposition because I'm against you. You're actually going through it because you're at the right place at the right time. It's a divine season. Come on. Every time we would put something on the map or on the calendar for Aguas de Sanidad, all hell would break loose. I'm just telling you. Spiritual warfare on a level that I've never, that I had never experienced before. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm talking things, but you got to read the book, okay? <laughs> and so we have to be able to, after a while, you kind of go, duh. Okay, God, I get it, right? So how do you know when you're entering into a divinely ordained season? How can you identify Kairos moments? Well, here are some signs to look for. Number one, the waters are stirred. And I take that from John 5 when at the pool of Bethesda, uh, the, the angel of the Lord would come and stir the waters. No one knew when it would happen. Hello? Let me say it again. No one knew when it would happen because it was a Kairos thing. And heaven would come down and stir something on earth. And the picture was whoever was there, people with maladies and incurable diseases and infirmities and the paralytic, they were all there. And when the waters were stirred, only at that moment, outside of that moment, it was just a swimming pool. There was nothing, you could get in the same water and it did nothing for you. Anybody in the house. But when you get in the waters, when it stirred, you were instantaneously healed. The first person in. I want to be the first person in. I don't want to miss a divine moment. I'm not looking for a swimming pool. I'm looking for holy waters. Hello? So when the waters are stirred, respond. Start moving. Start giving. Start doing. Start digging. Number two, divine unrest. In other words, all of a sudden you're not satisfied where you'd always previously been satisfied. Right? Right? In other words, you're hungry. All of a sudden, it's not, it's the level in which you were living in the secret place with the Lord is not enough anymore, and you need an increase. See, there's nothing like a famine to get you good and hungry. God, why are we going through this famine? Are you hungry yet? Are you hungry yet? Are you hungry yet? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> the third thing is, another sign you need to look for is when God begins to repeat himself. You wake up in the morning and you turn, you open the Bible and it's, you know, 1 Corinthians 16, 5 through 9. You're like, there's something about that verse. But, well, yeah, wow, that's a good verse. You get in the car and you turn on the radio and it's Christian radio because that's all you ever listen to. Okay. And you turn on the radio and all of a sudden the DJ comes on and says, well, the word of the day today, the scripture of the day is 1 Corinthians 16, 5 through 9. And you're like, shut up. <laughs> right? And, you're, you can't, and then your bestie calls you or as men say, my buddy. Because buddies, you know, guys usually don't say besties. They're like, my buddy. This is my buddy. And so your buddy calls you or your bestie calls you and says, hey, I was thinking about you, praying for you. I just felt like the Lord wanted me to give you this uh, scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 16, 5 through 9. You're like, shut up. <laughs> Cannot believe you're even saying that. Well, God is repeating himself. It's like he's doing the big whistle that you can do really loud, right? And then the fourth thing uh, that is a sign that you could look for are prophetic markers. And that is when you're sure that something was ordained by God, but you don't have the full picture yet. So I want you to track with me. And I don't have time tonight because I used time in the beginning, so I'm not going to give you the whole story. But it's like you're standing in a place and, and you determine to start moving towards something. The Lord says, I want you to do that. I'm calling you to do that. I'm ordaining you to do that. And you're like, man, I feel that stirring so I'm going to put a marker right here. And then you just go on your way and all of a sudden something else pops up. 
And you're like, oh my goodness, this is connected to that. Lord, I don't, get, I don't have the full picture, but I hear you, and I'm marking this spot. I'm writing this down, right? Or I'm typing it out in notes on my iPhone, whatever. But you're making a note of it, and you mark it. And then all of a sudden, something else, you're like, oh, I see a pattern. And then something else, oh my gosh, this is God. And then something else, and then opposition rises up. And then you're in Ephesus, and the very people who should be spiritual leaders are coming against you, or the very people that you thought would, would support you in your ministry say, no, sorry, see you, they, they ghost you, they disappear. And you're standing out on the edge, and you're like, wait a second. And God says, I want you to go there. Go there. God, seriously, listen, it's not going to be a big, brave jump, because you're going to look back and you're going to go, I know this is you. I know this is you. I know it's you. I know it's you. God, this is you. And you walk into it. This is how leaps of faith that are so celebrated by people who haven't taken them, this is how those things happen. When I go to a church and they say, oh, missionaries are my heroes. Don't, I, I get it, and I'm honored at that. Yet I look at that and I go, I'm just like you. I'm just like you. And, and there's been times I was scared to death. But the Lord taught me early on that when I hear him, when I sense him, I need to make a note of it. I need to pay attention at divine seasons. I need to like mark that down because I'm going to need those things as convincers to leap into the place he's called me to. Or to move into the season he's calling me to move into. Does that make sense, anybody? So what can you expect when you enter into divine seasons? What should you watch for? So I've given you four things that help you identify. I have to take a breath. They help you identify when you're moving into a divine season. But what do you, should you watch for when you move in? <laughs> when you step out. Here it is. You ready? Number one, you have to understand that open doors always draw attention from the enemy. When God opens a door, the enemy feels the rush of air. He's aware of what's happening, and he's going to do everything he can to distract you and keep you from going through that door. There was even a time a couple of weeks ago where I thought, well, God, I mean... Did I really hear you on Fiji? And I'm like, did I just say that? Because I've got my, I've got a list here of the things that God's done. Like that, like that thought does not line up with the evidence of God's provision. That thought does not like that feeling. And I'm going to talk about this tomorrow night. I want you to be here tomorrow night because I'm going to talk about handling change, specifically facing fear. And I, I believe it's a transformative message for you. I'm going to blend the clinical, because I'm a clinician, I'm a therapist, a licensed professional counselor. I'm going to blend that clinical through a scriptural lens. And I believe that the Lord has given me some solid things to share with you that I think are going to help you as you move into your divine season. Conquer fear. Um, I just interrupted myself to the point where, yeah, I don't, I don't even remember. So the evidence, the evidence is totally opposite to my feeling because my feeling is not fact. So you have to check the facts. If you have no facts, go to the word. Lord, your word says Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, the desert, he was being tempted. He never, he never said, I'm so tired and I'm hungry. Can you leave me alone? Wow, bread, that sounds really good right now. I mean, 40 days, folks. 40 days, not Daniel's fast. That was a Jesus fast right there, right? 40 days. Every time the enemy came to him and tried to appeal to his emotions and his thoughts, he turned around and says, the word says, it is written. Because when you get in the thick of things, we are still human 
and your humanity will try to inform you and you cannot allow that to happen. You have to only allow that the word of God and the evidence of what God has done through those prophetic markers, that informs you of his will. I'm just saying. So, one theologian put it this way, great success in the work of the gospel commonly creates many enemies. He went on to say, the devil opposes those most and makes the most trouble for them who most heartily and successfully set themselves to destroy his kingdom. There were many adversaries that Paul faced, and therefore, because of that, because of that, that was a sign to him, because of that, the apostle determined to stay. So here's the takeaway from this point. Are you ready? Opposition is a sign of divine opportunity, not divine abandonment. Opposition is a sign of divine opportunity, not divine abandonment. So the second thing that you should watch for and expect when you enter into a divine season is this. You need to understand that divine seasons will always require courage. Always. Courage is useless without opposition. What's the point of courage? If not to inspire you and convince you to leap into the lion's den. True courage is wedded by opposition. So that word wedded literally means it's, it's aroused, it's kindled, it's triggered, it's sparked, it's quickened, it's inspired, it's animated, it's awakened, it's fueled. True courage is fueled by opposition. The third thing that you need to watch for and expect when you enter into a divine season is know that the enemy will always speak your language. Have you ever, I'm sure you have because hello, your pastors are Pastor Ed and Connie Ainsworth, folks. I'm sure you've at least heard of the book, The Five Love Languages. (laughs) I'm sure you have at least heard of it. You've probably heard it on the radio broadcast already. Is that right? I knew it. I knew it. That's why we dress alike. Anyway, I read your mind. Listen, the five love languages, if you don't know, it's a book that says there are five different ways that people express love, and usually the way they express it is what they're wanting to receive. It's the thing that they value from others that gives them, they feel valued, and and they feel cherished, right? Well, let me turn that on its head. The enemy will always speak your fear language. He knows the top ways to scare you to death. He knows how to get you riled up, scared, and retreating. And you have to expect that when you enter into places and seasons, uh, when you enter, when you try to bury yourself deeper in Christ, the enemy is going to start trying to scare you and intimidate you to turn around. And you'll say, listen, you're like, God, what is the deal? I've committed to start honoring you with my tithe, and now my finances are worse. Don't stop. Don't stop. What you're facing is temporary. What you've activated is an eternal principle that God's word cannot lie and cannot fail. Because when you give, it'll be given unto you, good measured, pressed down, shaken together, will men give unto you. That's the way it works, right? So be aware of that. The enemy will always try to get you to bargain with him. I remember when I first was leaving for the mission field, I was called when I was four, and I was called to go when I was about 28. And I remember I was working at the number one Christian radio station in the nation, contemporary Christian radio station, which was KSBJ in Houston. And they, were, they at the same time, the Lord had spoke to me, about leaving for the mission field, he literally spoke to me and said, in 90 days, if you're willing and if you're obedient, you'll be on the mission field. And I'm like, 90 days? Like, I got a good thing going here, you know? (laughs) Like, I mean, I want that, but how's that going to happen in 90 days? But see, I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew I was in a divine season. 
And then after the Lord spoke to me, the next day I go into the radio station to work and the general manager calls me in and says, we want to promote you. And we want you to be the liaison and evangelism and outreach coordinator. And you're going to interface and work with all of the local ministries, parachurch ministries and church ministries in the greater Houston area. And we're going to pay you more to do that. And you'll still be on the air. And I said, Jesus, this is your mission for me. This is what you want. This is my mission field, right? Yay, a bigger paycheck too. This, this is definitely you, right? But yeah, that was a bargain. It was like the enemy was trying to get me to bargain. And I, and I did. I brought it for the Lord. And I was like, is this you? you know, and, and when he's silent, I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> you know? So the enemy will always try to get you to bargain with him. The more you try to pacify fear, the greater strength it gains. In Isaiah 36, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but this is fascinating. In Isaiah 36, you see a picture of when the enemy spoke the language of fear over the people of God. In Isaiah 36, a foreign king had sent his commanding officer to basically announce war against the Israelites. And he came in, the commanding officer did not follow, I want you to hear this clearly, he didn't follow the rules of war. There were rules of war where your commanding officer goes in and has an audience with their commanding officers. And you announce war and you set the parameters of war. It was very kind of a decent little thing usually, right? But no, he's not going to do that because he's going to fight his way. And he didn't want to go to the commanding officer. He wants to go to the people who are on the wall. And so the commanding officer comes up and he starts speaking in the language of the Israelites. He spoke their language and said, God has abandoned you. He's not going to come through. Have you heard of my king's reputation, the strength, the army, blah, 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 blah. And literally the commanders came out for Israel and said, please, just speak to us in Aramaic. Don't speak in the language of the people. Just speak with us privately. No, the enemy doesn't want to do that. He wants to speak your language. Why? Greater fear. So be aware of that. The fourth thing that you need to watch for when you come into a divine season is you have to develop a lifestyle of tools and weapons. It's not one or the other. You have to learn to carry a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other. Both tools and weapons are necessary for breakthrough. This has to become natural to you. It's not one or the other. You have to navigate both of them simultaneously. Spiritual multitasking, that's what it is. In other words, you have to learn to be vigilant against the enemy while on assignment and building what God told you to build. Anybody? In other words, you see that. Where's a picture of that? In Nehemiah. When the Lord put it in Nehemiah's heart to go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. There was a point where they couldn't do any more because the rubble was so great. And then uh, Sambalot and Tobias were sending letters and threatening and spreading rumors and, and all of this stuff. And they were threatening war. And so Nehemiah said, okay, here's the deal. You're using, you've got your tools where you're doing mortar, clay, whatever it was that they were working with. So you keep using that, but I want you to have your sword in your hand at all times. And friends, I believe that we're entering into a season of the last days before Jesus Christ returns. Every, the whole reason I was having a, a um, conversation with Grampy <laughs> today, and we were talking about how you don't hear preaching about the eternal things. You don't hear a lot of preaching about the return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, the rapture of the church, spending eternity with the Lord, entering into a divine rest, a perfect, unhindered communion with God like he intended for it to be in the first place before sin entered, right? And I just think about that, and I just think, listen, everything that we're preaching here has everything to do with that. There's no point in preaching what we preach if we're not preparing you for eternity. 
We're not here to give you live your best life now. No, you're not going to live your best life now. Your best life is in heaven with Jesus. That was his intention. That's his goal. That's his big plan. That's the big reveal. The big reveal isn't how comfortable can I get you here? The big thing is how comfortable, uh, how uncomfortable are you willing to be so that you can be ready when Jesus comes and you've resisted what the world, the world's plan be to eternity with the Lord Jesus. So everything I'm talking about here today has to do with that. Even Nehemiah, that was a picture of something. It's like when you enter into the last days before Jesus comes and the kingdom comes to life, right? He takes us to heaven. All of these things have to do with that weapons and tools. If there's ever a time we need to have a weapon on us at all times, it's now. But if there's ever a time that we need a sickle in our hand to reap a harvest and do the work of the kingdom, it's right now. Because Jesus is coming soon. I used to be the kind, it was one or the other. It's like, can I have, you know, five days to go fast and get through this? Listen, you have to, you know, finding Nemo, Dory, you just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. You just, you just keep swimming. Yes, you need seasons of rest. And God will tell you that and provide for that. But you have to keep moving. Divine seasons. You need to know this. This is the good part. Divine seasons always bring breakthrough. Divine seasons always bring breakthrough. I love it in 2 Samuel 5. David has established the, the city of David, which was Jerusalem. And the enemy said, you'll never make it in here. It's impossible. And God said, really? And David, like, takes the city and he fortifies it. And that was the time in his life when he actually began to advance the kingdom out of that place. So he's in the city of David. And an old enemy, when he's finally settled and he finally made it and established the, the, uh, the kingdom, the headquarters there, right? He's finally there. And an old enemy shows up again, the Philistines. And he heard that the Philistines were coming up. And the Bible says when they came up, David went down to the stronghold. When the enemy came up, David knew when to hide himself in the Lord and hear a word from the Lord. He didn't, he was a man of war. He was a great man of war. But the greatest thing about David was he wanted to hear the heart of God. Before he would raise his weapons, he had to hear from the Lord. And the Bible says, so David went to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them after he heard from the Lord. He said, as waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies from before me. So that place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Baal Perazim literally means the Lord broke through. Friends, in, in my first closing, you know how that goes. Can I encourage you to keep in mind that divine seasons and Cairo seasons are directly connected to spiritual warfare? In other words, to what's happening in the spirit realm. And, and I'll give you a practical. When God's ready to move in a church, there'll be bickering and division that'll break out. And it really has nothing to do with sister so-and-so sat in sister so-and-so's seat. And that's her seat. It's always been her seat. It'll always be her seat. And you need to move. It really doesn't have to do with the drums are too loud. I can't stand the drums. The drums are irritating me. Or the sound system's too loud. Or 
they let women preachers preach in that place? You know, it's like, okay, that may be a spiritual issue. But anyway, the, the other stuff, right, it's spiritual. It's because the enemy knows how to stir things up to distract his distractions from a great and effective open door. So the Bible says in Proverbs 26, 20, that where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Leviticus 6.12 says the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. In Argentina, we had a saying that you would hear in the churches and you'd hear the young people, you'd hear people under the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then they would just shout out, they, they would say, El fuego de Dios no se apagará, which means the fire of God will never go out. The fire of God will never be extinguished. And it was like, we want your fire. Ooh, do you feel that? God, your fire, the fire of heaven doesn't go out. If there's no fire on the altar, it's because there's a lack of wood. The fire in heaven does, is never extinguished. The problem is wood on the altar. God provides the fire. We provide the wood. What is the wood? It's our will. What is our will? Our, our, what is the wood? It is things that the Lord said, don't do that. It's something that the Lord says, if you'll do this, I'll do that. Okay, God, I'll do it. It's obedience. It's obedience. It's sacrifice. It's an offering of worship and praise. It's attentiveness to his presence. It's treating him like he's real and not not something that we're studying and that we come together and it makes us feel a little bit better. It's like, Lord, you're with me. You're here. In other words, when you're coming into a divine season, a consecrated time, the way to successfully, the number one way to successfully enter into that is you consecrate yourself. And every morning, you never allow the altar to be lacking wood. You always say, God, my, not my will. Not my will. I found myself praying that this afternoon. Lord, not my will. This morning in communion. Lord, not my will. Your will. Lord, where I've been willful, will I, where I have summed up a situation or a person, and I've been wrong. I give you my summation, and I surrender it, and I'll let you change my heart about that situation or about that person. Friends, that's wood on the altar. Would you stand, please? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Tomorrow I'll have, tomorrow evening I'll have uh, some media that I'll be using um, with what I have to speak to you about. And uh, it'll kind of be a variation. It'll vary from how I've ministered and preached today. But I believe it, I believe it's key for so many of you, really for all of us. So I just really encourage you, bring a friend. If you know of a friend that's been dealing with fear in their life, uh, fear of change or or just fear in general, um, and that leads to anxiety, etc. I, I just encourage you, call them and get them here tomorrow night, okay? Because I believe God's going to move in their life. So many times we, God will move in the altars when we have an experience in the Lord and in, in the holy place, you know, of His presence. And there's other times where the breakthrough and the transformation happens when, when we know the truth. We discover truth, and then the truth sets us free. So I believe tomorrow night will be that, prayerfully so. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
fuego de Dios no se apagará. Lord, your fire will never be extinguished. There's fire available, Lord, if we'll put ourselves on the altar. The fire will fall. The fire will fall. Lord, I believe with all my heart that you're preparing this family of believers for spiritual breakthrough and for advancing your kingdom in this city and beyond. And so, Lord, I'm, I ask you, would you speak to their hearts right now? Because this message is key. We have to be able to recognize. Jesus, you wept over Jerusalem and you said, oh, Jerusalem, if you only knew. <laughs> and then you said, you missed your day of visitation, Jerusalem. Lord, we don't want to miss our day of visitation. We don't want to miss an open heaven. We don't want to miss what you're desiring to do. We don't want to bring a spiritual delay to a region or a nation. We want to be in step with you. And breaking it down even more, we don't want to miss what you want to do in our family. We don't want to miss what you want to do in our marriage or our children or our church. So friends, I, I think here's what I'm going to do. First of all, I want to ask you this. Is there anyone in this place tonight that you have never opened up a relationship with the Lord? You've never just literally, you're saying, well, what is that? And I hesitate to say, use the church phrases, you know, like to be saved. Well, we're, we're saved. Just kidding. We're saved when, thank you for coming to catch me, Jeff. We're saved when the Lord reveals to us that, that there's something there that's blocking us from Him. And that's what we refer to as sin. It's, it's the thing that keeps the Lord from getting to be near you. And He doesn't hate you because of sin. He hates the sin because of what, of, what sin is doing in your life. And He wants to take that away but he won't force himself on us. So we have to invite him and we have to say, Lord, I invite you to take that away. And I'm telling you, I know it's there. I know what I've been doing is I've been living without you. I haven't even acknowledged you or I've been living in something that's such a habit. I don't know where to start, but I invite you in. And would you take this sin away? Forgive me and cleanse me and just make me a new person. Friends, at that moment, something happens spiritually in your life. And listen, you're more a spiritual being than you are a physical being. Something happens in the spirit. And the Lord wipes that sin away. And he has full access to you and you have full access to him. And if you need that, would you just lift your hand right now? You've never made that transaction with God. You've never made that initiation, that conversation with God. And you say, I need that. Anybody here? We want to give you opportunity to invite the Lord in. He gets to check under the bed. He gets to go into every closet. He sees if your oven is clean or dirty. I mean, he just gets all up in all of your life so that he can get out everything that has hidden and trying to destroy you because he loves you. Yeah. So I'm assuming that everyone has a relationship with the Lord. So now I'm going to ask you my part two, and I know it's getting late, but I ask you tonight um, if you would spend time at the altar and you would put some wood on the altar. That's all we're going to do tonight. And that's what we need to do, right? So I'm going to invite you as, as we sing and worship, make an altar somewhere in this place and have a talk with the Lord. And more than that, let the Lord talk to you. And do like David said. David said, Lord, search me, O oh God, and know me. 
and see if there be any wicked way in me. And his other prayer was, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your Holy Spirit. Don't cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So would you do that right now? I'm just going to invite you. This is very simple. Would you just come? We've got altars here, chairs at the front, anywhere around here. If, if you're more comfortable just staying at your seat, that's fine too. And let's just spend time with the Lord. I want you to put some wood on the altar. He provides the fire. We provide the wood. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Y'all go ahead. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Your glory, God, is what 
Have I not commanded you, be very strong, be courageous, don't fear, don't fear, for I'm with you. Not only am I with you, but I'm ahead of you. I am going before you. I am your God. I will lay low the mountains and I will cause the pits and the valleys to rise up under your feet. I'm with you. You can trust me. The thing that I've asked of you, I will give you grace as you walk in obedience. I will meet you with taking a hold of your right hand and I will walk with you every step of the way and you will be met with my blessing and I will cause your soul to prosper. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. Where you've walked in great darkness or in great stress and anxiety and even faced bouts of depression, I am changing and undoing those strongholds. And I am reversing those things, even in your own mind, to bring order and to establish peace. If you will cooperate with me, if you will walk with me, if you will lay everything on the altar, I will cause those things that seemed impossible to be consumed by my presence, by the fire and the glory that's within me. Trust me. Trust me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, one last thing before we leave. I felt like the Lord wants us to pray over all of those that are 30 and under. So if you'll come up here, I'm going to just pray over over you generation of people. <clears throat> and um, just because I've got an old vantage point. Come on up, Bailey and Emmy. Come on up. You know, um, I, I talked about two different revivals that I experienced today. And basically, there has not been a substantial move of God that any of these young people have seen in their lifetime. And I just am declaring that you are going to see it. <laughs> that it is, it's going to be beyond anything that I've ever seen. And, and, and uh, that 
tonight just it has, I just believe tonight that it's been imparted into every one of you to have courage to have faith to see God do something amazing through each one of you he's going to do something awesome through each one of you let's see how many of y'all are up here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 or 11 did you say 12? Oh, I thought you said 12. 11? Okay. I'm the 12th. Did y'all know 12 disciples changed the world? I mean, you just think about that. Just think about the, the concept of that. You know, when you feel like, what can I do? <laughs> and what you can do is just be obedient. And so, Lord, tonight, Lord, I pray over every one of these young people. Lord, I thank you for Deanja. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that there is a call of God upon her life. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, that you've called her out. You've consecrated her for something really special, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Chris, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, that you're raising up a mighty man of God right here, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for increasing his faith, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Emmy and Bailey, Lord. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord, for the heritage of godliness, Lord, in both of these girls, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The spiritual gifts are being pulled out of every one of these young people, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Madison. Lord, right now, Lord, I just pray that you begin to pull on all those things that are on the inside of Madison, Lord, that have been planted there for years, Lord, that boldness would come upon her, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for Reagan, Lord, just her faithful spirit, sweet spirit, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Reagan, I'm just hearing that you're going to wake up. And the Lord's going to have you praying for people. Your prayers are going to make a huge difference in people's lives. That you're going to immediately know, oh, i got to pray for that person. They're on my mind for that very reason. And you're going to see miracles take place as you pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for Hunter, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for his grandma that wanted to get him to you when he was two years old, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, just the things that, Lord, already you put on the inside of him, Lord. Call, Lord, I just call out those leadership qualities, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hunter, the Lord just wants you to live in a just an attitude of staying right with Him. If you for if it's through forgiveness, whatever it is, just don't let any kind of little anything, any little sin creep in that's going to keep you separated from Him, feeling like oh He didn't want to hear from me again. I've already apologized for that. As teenagers, we all do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a natural progression of growing in your spiritual life. Just be quick to repent. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're imparting humility into Hunter, Lord. Lord, that the words that come out of his mouth, Lord, that they're going to be your words, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've called him out to be a leader. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for Danny, Lord. I thank you for his heart after you, Lord, his precious heart after you, God. Oh, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that already, that Danny already will flourish in the gifts that you put on the inside of him, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I just see evangelism, Danny, just coming, that you're, you're going to draw people to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that right here within this group of young people, the, the fivefold manifested, the ministries are going to come forward, Lord, that there's preachers, teachers, there's apostles, that there's evangelists and prophets right here in this group of people, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Aiden, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, 
thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The devil's tried to kill you, Aiden, in so many different ways, just to beat you down. Just kill your spirit through rejection. And right now, I thank you, Lord, that no rejection could ever take hold of Aiden, that he is loved, he's accepted in every possible way. Lord, you chose him. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that just like Renee and the things she's been through, Lord, that you're going to use Aiden to rescue, deliver people, Lord, that they feel like they're alone, they feel like they've been abandoned. And, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that Aiden is going to bring hope. Lord, into kids' lives, even into his school, that feel like they've been abandoned by parents, they've been discarded, and Lord, that he is going to bring the hope of Jesus to them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for Charlie and Ashley. And, Lord, their testimony of your faithfulness to their lives, Lord. Lord, I declare over them they are not orphans. Lord, they are not orphans. Lord, I speak over them, Lord, that they, Lord, that you, you planned them, Lord. Lord, they came straight from your heart, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And, Lord, everywhere that rejection has tried to beat them down, I just come against it in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you, God, that you've chosen them. You've adopted them, Lord, that you've adopted them into your family, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And, Lord, we just agree with them for their desire to have a baby. Lord, we come into agreement with them today. Lord, that in your timing, Lord, that, and, and Lord, I thank you that healing is coming, Lord, to both of them in their minds, their emotions, physically. They're going to experience healing in every way. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know if any of you, if all of y'all got Charlie and Ashley's testimony. They wrote it not too long ago and put it in a booklet. But Ashley's mother put her in a dumpster to leave her. And her grandmother found her. And she ended up getting back with her um, mother later on. She was given back to her mother who, who abused her severely. And it is Ashley's desire to be a mother herself. And, you know, everything that, Lord, I just know that you're going to restore everything where the enemy tried to steal from Ashley's, tried to tell her she's not wanted. Lord, you have put that desire on the inside of her. And, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that it is going to come to pass. We come into, we believe it, Lord. And, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you had your hand upon Ashley from the very time that that she was born, that the enemy could not take her out in any way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let Lord just let Ashley and Charlie know, like never before, Lord, that they have been adopted into your family. Oh, Lord, that it's so much better than any natural family that we could have, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Man, the devil's tried to kill their generation where they won't see a move of God. Are y'all in agreement? This generation is going to get to see the greatest move of God that's ever taken place.